This stuff we've already discussed. Cardiovascular complications, I mean, things happen. Peep, high peep will decrease venous return. Venous return. It's coming up to the superbian cave and inferbian cave. It gets lower. Ooh, a lot of positive pressure in there. It can lower your blood pressure. You're going to learn about protocol that our head of bed ideally will be elevated at 30 degrees. But sometimes not, because when your pressure is low, your head of bed is not elevated. And you, we discussed that in our SVT exercise, I will next gen. Some of you wanted to, ooh, shoulder press, raise the head of the bed. Ah, oh, the hypotensive. Oh, snap. Hypotension. Hey, when you're in the vent and laying in the bed, we don't want you to get a clot in your leg, so Lovenox is on your mar. Except when you're on heparin, and then you don't need the Lovenox. Because I don't want you to get a clot. I don't want you to get a DVT, and I don't want you to throw a PE. Can you think that decreased venous return will lower your cardiac output? Of course. Endocrine. This is fancy. I'm not the endocrine queen, okay? But sodium water retention, stimulation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. That's not in the test. Neuro can increase your ICP. That's not on your test, but it will be on your test when Dr. Wiggins teaches you about intracranial pressure. And suctioning is a thing like, look, get in, get out. Because they might be vented post-craniotomy and you need to do it, just get in, get out. You would expect that suctioning would increase their ICP, but it's gonna go away when it stops suctioning. We already talked about barotrauma and body trauma. I don't want to over distend those little alveoli and cause a pneumothorax where I have air now in my pleural space requiring a chest tube inserted in my pleural space. Who's gonna put that in? Not me, not you, but we're gonna help. Better know where your chest tube tray is. Better know where that setup is. Sub-Q emphysema. Ooh, has anybody ever felt sub-Q emphysema? Snap, crackle, pop, rice, crispies. I mean, you're palpating, you're like, it's crunchy. It's like popping those bubbles from that plastic stuff when you get something from Amazon. Oh my God, what do we do about that? We circle it with a Sharpie, and we let the doc know, and we watch it to see if it's getting worse. It's probably gonna reabsorb. Mm -hmm. Right main stem intubation, we already talked about that guy. Premature extubation. When the patient's doing this, and guess what? They can even grab that 14 French suction catheter and pull that tube out. Have people extubated themselves on my watch? Mm-hmm. Egg on my face. I don't want to tie them down. And when you do use bilateral soft first restraints, you better document. I tell my people, chart like Morris Park is reading your nurse's notes. Chart with a jury in mind. They're tied down, or maybe they have an A-line or a femoral sheet or something. You better describe good distal circulation to me. Because Morris, you know what I mean? I swear, I've said it before, but I should call him and say, I could be a gazillionaire. What, what I know about nurses' notes, Morris, you want me to work with you. Mr. Bart, my name is Wendy Harris. All right. We don't want O2 toxicity. So even though initially we put you on 100%, as soon as the ABGs reflect a decent PaO2, now, you looked at ABGs last week. pH is 7.35 to 7.45. The PaO2 is somewhere between 80 and 100, right? PCO2, 35 to 45. Base excess 22 to 26 plus or minus two, somewhere in, right? So that means I've got a good normal pH 7.40, perfect. PCO2 is 40, PO2 is 90 on Romare, and my bicarb is 24. Perfect, perfect. But O2 toxicity. And you want to, that was making you think, you want to wean that PAO2 down. But here's a little trick that you'll learn in clinical with me. Like for example, Dakota's post-op part yesterday, we said he was gonna come out on SIMD with a rate and a volume and an FIO2 of 100%. I wrote a little stick man for those eight, and I said, I am expecting his PAO2 to come back in the 300s. Because 100% times three is 300. What if I had you on 80%? 80 times three, I'd expect that PAO2 to be 240. What if it was 60%? 60 times three is 180. What if you were on 40%? If your PAO2 didn't come back 120, hmm, 
with me? That's just a rule of thumb. If you're gonna work in critical care, you gotta know that. It's not like, well, normal is 80 to 100, Ms. Garrison, but not when you're on 100%. Because that's what we're gonna we're calculate a PEF ratio. What the heck is that, Ms. Garrison? It's something that we look at. It is something that we look at. The PM ratio. You need gases, the PaO2, divided by the fraction of inspired oxygen that they're on, the FiO2. So say it was Dakota's post op part yesterday. The PaO2 came back 332. But it was on 100% oxygen. 100% written as a decimal <coughs> is the number one. Woohoo! Let me tell you so, something about PF ratio. A PF ratio should be greater than 400. 300 to 300 to 399 is like, okay. I'm okay. Nah, I'm all right. I'm all right. 200, 201. To 299. That's a cute lung injury. I don't like that. Unless it's 200, it's ours. It's ours. Boom. I like this number. I like numbers. I can gauge if they're getting better or worse. Take that to the bank. Take this to the bank. I like PF ratio. You will see have questions with PF ratio. I might not say, go ahead and figure out the PF ratio. If I've given you bed settings and you have gases, you figure it out on your own. Tag your it. When you graduate, tag your it. I don't want to do that. You're it. All right. What else we got? We don't want them to prematurely estimate, so adequately sedate them. Explain the teaching to the patient, keep it simple. Join the tube. The reason I have the bilateral soft pressure stays with your dad is so he won't pull his tube. I don't want him to ask for it. Interesting. We had two vented patients yesterday, but only because one was MPO for a procedure, so it was not on tube feeding, but the other one was. And the uh, an OG tube, it's just a 14 French Salem sum. If you put it in the nose, it's called an NG tube. If you put it in the mouth, into the stomach, it's an OG tube and they were getting vital HP, high protein, at 45 mils per hour to assess residuals. When I was you, a senior nursing school back in the day, up till a year ago, I consistently checked residuals Q4 hours. We're giving you your tube feeding. In the old days, it was like, okay, if you're getting 45 an hour times two, if I pull back more than 90 mils, I'll return that, because I don't want to mess up your pH. I don't want to pull out all the acid in your stomach, I'll return that. But I would turn the tube feeding off for an hour, <coughs> allow your gut to reabsorb that, and I would resume the tube feeding. Here lies the problem. Nurses forgot to turn it back on. Mm -hmm. So vented patients are not getting their nutrition and their calories to produce energy to work that diaphragm to get them extubated. So then AACN, the American Association of Critical Care Nurses, say, you know, when you drink a bottle of water, that's over 200 mils, so let's come up with the number 200. If it's more than 200 mils, then hold it for an hour. But do you know what the word on the street is these days? And I have to hold on to something. Mm -hmm. Don't even check residuals. I am old school. Mm -hmm. Chris, I'm here to tell you. This chick's checking residuals. Now, yesterday, who was with Ingrid? You two. <coughs> How, what was the residual? 200? She returned it, but she didn't turn off the two feeding. She didn't, she didn't turn off the two feeding. You with me? Now, those young little whip snap of pulmonologist one. Why are you checking the residual evidence price practice says don't even check it? Because I'm Wendy the warrior, that's why. And I don't want my patient to ask mm -hmm. That's why. Head of bed should be up mm -hmm. 30 degrees. I hope your pressure's not low. Because can you drink all you now? I can't. I'll try. <laughs> I'll try. All right. I can eat ice cream when you I have, I have done that. Um, that endotracheal tube can pretty much stay in for 21 days. It's kind of like, it's not a hard, fast rule, and then we have to consider a trach. Because you can't keep that down their trachea the whole time. Hey, you could live with a trach for a lifetime. What the heck is that? It's coming. Ventilator-acquired pneumonia. Five things. 
standard of care, you gotta know it. Head of bed is up. You're on Lovenox, you know, anoxaparin in the belly, or SCDs, protonics, proton pump inhibitor. It's stressful to be on the bed. I don't want you to get a stomach ulcer. Good mouth care, Q4 with chlorhexidine, and is today the day we're gonna turn off the sedation, sedation vacation, and you're gonna breathe on your own. I walk in every vented patient's room and I ask that question, and I could answer for who's patient yesterday that's getting the probable amputation. No. In fact, Kelly, the, the nurse, turned off the sedation, but not for long, huh? Because he was in a lot of pain. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hey, did I post a separate page that says A, B, C, D, E, F bundle? Mm -hmm. or, you have that page. This is important. <coughs> a bundle. A bundle is evidence-based evidence practice. A. Sure, they're intubated and they're sedated, but are they in pain? Ask them. Turn off the sedation and ask them if they're in pain and treat their pain. B, spontaneous breathing trials. We're gonna put you on CPAP and see how you do. C, what choice of sedation do we have them on? D, are they getting delirious? You think ICU patients get delirious? Heck yeah, because the lights are on and it's too noisy and all that nonsense. E, early mobilization. I get misty when I see physical therapy walk in the unit and dangle a vented patient or move them passive range of motion because if we move them, they're going to have positive outcomes. And last but not least, the F is for the family. Let them in the room. Let them in the room. So there you go. You've got to know this. This is important. Now, document. Head of bed is at 10 degrees. BP 88 over 60. You just saved yourself. Because Morris was like, they weren't meeting that back criteria. I'm going to get that when you get in person. All right. Then we, it is a beautiful day when we think we've turned off the sedation. Is the day, the day, is today the day we're going to extubate you? <coughs> they haven't had any fever in a couple of days. The pneumonia is resolved. The chest x ray improved. Their respiratory rate is good, they're pulling in good volumes, their AVGs are good, their PF ratio, hey, we even extubated somebody one time with a PF ratio of 264, and I was like, wait a second, this PF ratio is not greater than 400, but it was a lot better than the 130 that he came in with, or the 150, we trended it. A good nurse looks at the trend. We don't look at any reading in isolation. They're stable. They've checked all the boxes. Awake alert oriented, secretions under control, and they're hemodynamically stable. You think if they were on any critical drugs that they're hemodynamically stable? Nope, and they're not getting extubated. That Glasgow coma scale, a perfect score is 15. A Glasgow coma scale less than eight, intubate. Now, you and I can't intubate, but we'll be bagging them while CRNA prepares to do what they need to do. Fair enough? We don't always go from a cis control to SINB to CPAP. Sometimes we go from a cis control to CPAP. What? In the old days, we always did that, but not today. We're monitoring their stats, their respiratory rate. How are they looking? They want the tube out. <coughs> we literally will, and I think I wrote, oh, it's, in, it's, in, it's in our critical thinking exercise. <coughs> So you don't have to write it down right now because I swear it's on your thing. We're, gonna, we're going to explain the procedure. We're going to explain the procedure to you. The first thing I always do is explain. So, okay, sir, what I'm going to do now, sit you up. I'm going to put a towel on you like you're eating a lobster. Respiratory's here. They're going to suction you out real good, and we're going to pull that tube and then slap on your oxygen. Maybe a nasal cannula. Maybe a face mask. Probably <coughs> just a nasal cannula. Now, that is not the time for you, the nurse, to go to lunch. You're going to watch a patient like a hawk. You don't want them to develop strider. You're going to watch them like a hawk. That's when you watch them like a hawk. Okay, we're going to go to lunch now. And you come back from lunch 35 minutes later, and there's a team around. And you see the hats, and you're like, uh-oh, they had emergency breathing to pay my patient. Not because you went to lunch, but nobody's going to watch a patient like you while you're at lunch. And somebody that just got freshly excavated, you watch them like a hawk. Fair enough? I want to put the fear of God in you. You need to have the fear of God in you. Um, monitor, watch your clothes, check your equipment. We already talked about the complications. 
Do vented people get fed? Heck yeah. What's the system on fire? Well, they're a renal failure patient. Maybe the doc will choose nephro, or pneumonia, pulmicare, or wound healing, vital HP, or they're a diabetic, they're a lucerna. It's got the perfect blend of carbs, fats, and proteins that that patient needs. We've already talked about the mouth care. We've already talked about hyperoxidative and prior suctioning. It's the day of the day. We're going to turn off the sedation, and you're going to breathe on your own. Hemodynamic monitoring, if they're not stable, not getting extubated. ABGs, I love ABGs. Watch them close, one-on-one. -on -one. When we're weaning, I am in your room. All right, now I am going to open up what I think is a phenomenal thing. And it is my critical thinking exercise. So we're going to have fun with this. Is this big enough for everybody in the back? The good thing about this room is that other one, man, the people in the back are like, can you make that bigger? We can't see it. <laughs> it's a very deep room. Will the code's like, what's she talking about? All right. This is what CC is. I just happened to jot all this stuff down one day. And then when COVID came around and they were like, what? I, can you do an ICU clinical seven weeks from your house? I'm like, yeah, I got some money. And so I put this thinking exercise together and I shared it with everybody. <coughs> it was, it's kind of good. It's kind of good. So I said, hey, I'm going to start doing this in class. All right. You know why we intubate somebody and keep breathing on their own. But why can't they breathe on their own? All those reasons pneumonia, drug overdose, anesthesia, ARS, sepsis, this, that, the other thing. Now there's some reasons why, but okay, we already know that. So this is a case study, and we're going to be looking at all this stuff, all this cool stuff. We're going to look at the ABGs, we're going to calculate the PF ratio, we're going to say, hmm, I think we should do this with the vent. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the priority nursing care, how you care for somebody for an event. Here she is. <laughs> Little 85 year old female, history of aortic valve stenosis, AFib, CHF, hypertension, dementia, and diabetes. Sound familiar? It, 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 have you ever had a patient with this kind of background? <laughs> Comorbid stuff. Admitted with aspiration pneumonia, a little gall and aspirate. Aspiration pneumonia. In addition to the shortness of breath and a cough, perfect timing, um, the patient also presents with a decrease in LOC as described by her daughter. Not to jump ahead to test four and not to commute over, what do you think is happening here? Alternization, she's getting septic. Let me plant this for you right now. My, my two current groups already know this. There's three things in a quick SOFA score. What the heck are you talking about? Sequential organ failure assessment. Sepsis is brewing when three things happen. Altered mentation. This isn't on this test, but it's going to be on test four. Altered mentation. Breathing faster than 22 times a minute. Systolic is less than 100. Hey, Doc, this is Wendy. Yes, sir. This is what's going on. You want me to get a lactate? I think they get septic. That's the kind of nurse we want you to be. I can see far away, I'm gonna use my glasses, okay. So, and it's amazing to see far away. Before my cataract surgery, I couldn't see, it was all blurry. Um, so, admitted with aspiration pneumonia, mm, she weighs 60 kilograms, little bitty thing, little bitty thing. Intubated with a number seven oral endotracheal tube, taped to 21 centimeters mid-lip with bed settings confirmed. She just came in, we put her on assist control because she's super sick, we want to assist her. And we put her on a frequency of 20, 20 breaths a minute. That's a good little rate. Mm -hmm. Don't know why they picked that, but that's what they picked. Tidal by 500. <coughs> it's a little goody thing. Oh, we're gonna, when we turn the page, we're gonna ask about that. Everybody gets started on 100% and five a peak. There's no pressure support there, you don't need that with assist control. 
So far, so good? Hmm, critical thinking. Why is she on assist control? She, she's sick. She's super sick. I want to assist her. Let's keep it simple. She's super sick. I want to assist her. She's got pneumonia. I think she has evolving sepsis. Let's put her on assist control. Describe the other bed settings. Her rate is 20. She weighs 60 kilograms. What do you think about that tidal volume of 500? I thought so too. I thought so too. I thought it was a little much. I did, but they didn't adjust it. Wendy the Wart was like, a little much. I don't want to, you know, her to develop a pneumothorax. Why do you think she's on 100% this time? Because that's where we start. She's sick and she needs it. We start at 100% and based on your ABGs, we wean it down. They will quickly wean that FiO2 down based on your ABGs. How is the peak beneficial? How is that positive end expiratory pressure beneficial? Say that again. It keeps the alveoli open. Very good. What diagnostic <coughs> criteria are we assessing daily to guide weaning from the vent? There's ABGs. Is today the day we're going to turn off your sedation and you're going to be better? Chest x rays, is pneumonia getting better? Are the secretions getting less? This mechanically vented patient is placed on diprovin, propofol, with orders to titrate medication to effect. The doc gives me this order diprovin or propofol, keep it a RAS minus two, but don't fall. Never again do I have to call that doc and say, well, this is going on or that's going on. We're the, we're the critical care nurse. We take care of it. What is the expected outcome of the propofol? The chill pill, babe. Hypnotic sedative. How is propofol administered? 1,000 milligrams, 100 mils, IV on the pump, never ever IV pushed, not within our RN scope of practice. What's the range? 5 to 50 mics per kilogram per minute but it ain't black and white. If somebody has a history of opioid abuse, and many people do, they're gonna need more sedation. One sedation may not do it. They might need two or three, and we've seen that in you. What are some unique assessments that the nurse may observe with propofol? I wanna tell you about the urine. Olive oil, cream. Oh my. It's not a bad thing, it's just olive oil green because it's a lipid and that's how we excrete it. Note to self, how are all these things cleared from the person's body? The kidneys and the liver? Are the kidneys and the liver working? Because if they're not, they're gonna have longer absorption times and less, and it's not, they're gonna take more days to clear. But Diprovan works quickly and Diprovan, when you turn it off, raise your right hand, put your three fingers up. I will never let my Diprovan bottle run dry. When my oncoming chip is coming, I'll have another bottle hanging. This is why. Because they will be a bucking bronco. Oh my God, my Diprovan's empty. Let me run to the Pixis and come back. They've already extubated themselves. You think I'm kidding? I'm not kidding. Shame, shame, shame. Shame. I'm sorry. You better be ready. I'm gonna set you up for success. When you follow me, you're going to have what you need. All right. <clears throat> have I always been that way? No. But I've learned over the decades. All right. What can propofol do to your blood pressure? It can lower it real quick. There's a time when we electively intubated a patient in CCU bed B. He was a young guy with Guy and Beret. This was years ago. And when his and this will be an exemplar coming down the pipe, not on test one. When his paralysis was approaching his abdomen, we electively intubated him. The CRNA came with a cute little hat and pushed the dipper van and he got crazy <laughs> hypotension. We had to give that man a lot of fluid to bring his blood pressure up. Propofol can make your blood pressure fall. If the blood pressure falls, what are two measures for the RN to raise it? Hint, this may involve calling the Doc. I still call it the doctor, the healthcare practitioner. Could be a nurse practitioner, an intensivist, hospitalist, whoever. I might need some fluid. 
Now, I'm here to tell you, reverse Trendelenburg, we don't do that anymore. Or Trendelenburg, blam, on the head. We don't do that anymore. You know why? Because it fools the power of receptors into thinking you're okay. You know what Dr. King Yuno is going to teach you? Lay them flat, put their feet up. You just did some passive leg raises, babe, and in essence gave them a little flu bowls. Lay them flat, put their feet up. We don't do Trendelenburg anymore, guys. We don't do Trendelenburg anymore. All right. So we might need fluid. I don't think you're going to need a presser, but if the fluid didn't cut it, because you can't press on the veins unless you got something in the veins. All right, so they're currently on 30 mics per kilogram per minute. They weigh 60 kilograms. The concentration is 1,000 milligrams and 100 mils. What should the RN set the pump at? And you gotta love pumps and CCU, man. Our little spectrum pumps, it will say, is this patient new to CCU? Yes. What unit you at CCU? Is the patient new to CCU? Yes. Name the first two letters of the trip. I don't know if it's BI or PR, but it'll say, oh, you're talking about Diprovan, 1,000 milligrams and 100 mil? Yep, that's the one. All right, incorporate the weight. Do the weight again. Uh, the safety check. The pump is awesome. But who programs the pumps? We humans. Mm -hmm. So I don't have my calculator. Did anybody figure it out yet what the mils per hour is? So 60 times. Thank the Lord. This is the way I set it up on the board. Just this morning, last night when I went to bed, my kitchen looked like a bomb exploded and I had laundry, but this morning, kitchen's clean, <coughs> laundry's done. I was poop, I was poop. You Tuesday and Wednesday people are killing me. You know, you gotta leave it nicer than the way you found it, and I'll always invite you back. I'm just saying. All right. What'd y'all come up with? 10.8. 10.8? That sounds about right. It's been a, it's been a minute since I thought about it. Did everybody get that? <clears throat> you feeling good about this equation? Well, good, because I would say 60 kilograms times, and what do they want? Might, for the doc wants you to start it at, well, it's at 30. 30 times 60, well, that's 1,800 mics per minute. And then times 60 minutes per hour times what the concentration is. And I know there's 1,000 milligrams in the bag, but I'm talking micrograms, so I always add my three zeros. My clinical students or anyone that's reviewed math with me know that I like to draw the bag. I like to draw the bag when I'm calculating a problem. All right. All right, all right, all right. How can we assess their sedation status? Rest. Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale. Where would we like to keep this patient regarding the rest? Minus two, baby. Here's the first set of gas. 7.283. What word is swirling in your brain? Acidosis. Acidosis. PCO 253. Name that baby. Wendy Marie Sabadee. Every baby has three names. I'm thinking the middle name is respiratory and the last name is acidosis. PAO 200. Well, she's on 100%. PF ratio, what's 200 divided by 1? Uh, that's not great. I don't want to make any labels now, but it ain't great. Okay, so at first, a newbie would say, oh, 80 to 100, that's fantastic. Not when you're on 100%. Body clock, 24.6. What are you, kidneys lazy or something? They're not doing a bloody thing to help. Not holding on to more body clock. So this is uncompensated respiratory acidosis. Do we all agree? All right. And the O2 stats are good. I'll take that. How would you interpret these AVGs we just did? Uncompensated respiratory acidosis. Please give me the full name. I just did, uncompensated respiratory acidosis. What bed setting changes would you anticipate and why? She has respiratory acidosis. And what do you think about that PAO2? What do you think? 
Now, how is this going to happen? The doc's going to say, respiratory, get the gases. <laughs> respiratory says, here, Wendy, here's the gases. Okay, doc, I'm calling you with the gases. And we give them the values, and they give us some new vent settings. What would you anticipate would be happening here? Anybody? Thoughts? So the, increase the respiratory rate? Because she's got respiratory acidosis? I kind of like that. What about the PaO2? Do you think, well, they really can't bump up the oxygen. Maybe you think they want to bump up the peak? I don't know. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. All right. What's our patient's PF ratio? We just did it. It's 201, right? Um, say that again? 200. Thank you. See short-term memory loss. The brain's going. Um, all right. When the health, I, I just like to look at the board. It's just so much better for me. Okay. When the healthcare practitioner, you, so okay, this is what happened. The healthcare practitioner said, the doctor said, decrease the FiO2 to 70%. And my head went, what? What? Now, I didn't, I'm raised by the nuns. I didn't say, ask the doctor. I didn't say, are you sure? Because I, I, like I told Chris one time, I asked the doctor during a cardi version, are you sure? And Stanley Blyche looked at me with laser beams to kill me. And he was never nice to me again. He was never nice to me to begin with. Okay, that's all right. So the doc decreases the FiO2 to 70%. O2 sats fell to 88%. I didn't say, <coughs> I didn't, I was thinking it, thinking of it, but. After, so, but, so what do you think the doc said to do? Respiratory, put them back on the original settings. I don't even know if we did increase the respiratory rate, but what they did was they decreased that FiO2 and I was perplexed because I was thinking, a patient's not gonna do well with that, and they didn't. Now, I'm not saying I'm a hot potato, but critical care nurses, you know your stuff. You know your stuff. All right. And when you graduate, ER nurses, OBGYN, L&D, NICU nurses, there's an organization for you to join your professional organization, and you get certified. And you are held to a higher standard. You are. You know a lot. You need to know a lot. All right. So after two days on assist control, patient's getting better because the antibiotics are kicking in. Why? Because we cultured the patient and we found the right antibiotic. Even after you culture, they're going to start you on broad spectrum antibiotic therapy. Something to cover gram negative, something to cover gram positive, and something to cover atypical. Then when we get the cultures back, okay, we're going to DC the zosin and put them on back. Because we need this, that, and the other thing. The patient's getting better. Chest x-ray is looking better, secretions are getting less, we're doing better. Successful weaning is taking place. Awesome. That's good. I want that for this precious little 85 year old lady. So there's one more. So we put it on the SIMV mode. We're weaning, babe. Rate of 14. Tidal volume still 500. She didn't drop a lung. What do I know? That bio 2 is down to 30%. Oh, heck yeah, we're better. PEEP is 5. Now we have pressure support. Because this is what SIMV says. I'll give you 14 breaths at 500, but if you breathe over that rate, you, you draw a breath through that skinny straw. It might need a little extra support to do that. We feeling this? You understand this? Good. All right. That's what SIMV mode means. I'll give you those breaths, but if you breathe over that rate, show me what you've got. You generate your own tidal volume. So does that little lady need two feeding? Absolutely. She needs calories, equates to energy. Because the diaphragm is just a muscle. On SIMV, what would happen if the patient's tidal volume was breathing over the rate? Show me what you got, babe. She generates her own tidal volume. And if she's pulling in good volumes, I think we're ready to do a CPAP trial. That's what I think. Now look at these gases. Hello. 7.363. PCO2 48.4, well, ain't perfect, but much better. PAO2 119. PF ratio 119 divided by 0.30, hello, 
FPF ratios in the 300s. I'll take that. O2 sats are great. This is fully compensated respiratory acidosis. You see the kidneys holding on to a little more bicarb. That pH looks normal, but these two key values, PCO2 and PAO2, would have to be bloody perfect. And the PCO2 is not bloody perfect. It's a little high. Pick a side. It's normal, it's, it's within the normal range, but it's more acidotic than alkalotic. So this is fully compensated respiratory acidosis. I expect you to know that. All right. <clears throat> All right. What's that PF ratio? Better. Better. Remember on the test, I'm not gonna say, remember to do your PF ratio. You have gases, you have med settings, you figure it out. <clears throat> How is our patient? Is she getting better? For all the reasons we just said, you bet her PF ratio looks good, her ABGs have improved. She's getting better. Hey, she's been AP for two days now, Doc. All right. What other labs are important to consider for a patient with oxygenation? Who's the Uber driver that carries the oxygen? Hemoglobin. 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 We ain't gonna extubate anybody with a hemoglobin less than seven, I'll tell you that. Make sense? Because that carries the oxygen. She's doing so well, but the doc says let's put her on a CPAP trial. And we know what that looks like on the bed. It's going to say spont. No rate, no volume, just the FiO2, the PEEP, and the pressure support. An SVT is a spontaneous breathing trial. Let's put them on CPAP. <coughs> so CPAP is sort of like a spontaneous breathing trial. How do they do? We did some CPAP trials and some of her patients couldn't hang. Her patient, yes, they couldn't hang for more than 30 minutes. And the RN that Stephanie was working with cranked up that protocol again. All right. Again, don't confuse that with the CPAP mask. They're still intubated. <clears throat> Just the FI2, the PEEP, and the fresh support. Is the vent giving any breaths? No. Is the vent giving any volumes? No. Or is the patient on CPAP generating their own rate volume? Yes and yes. Think this is a good study guy? Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. All right. So the patient did very well. It was successfully excavated, and this is how we did it. You know, these are the things. Let's talk about the nursing measures that will promote a successful extubation. First off, are they ready to be weaned? You gotta check all the boxes. Awake, alert, and oriented. Ideally, sedation's off. Although I've seen people extubated with a little crusted X on, it's crazy. But they're kind of an anxious patient, maybe on, at home on Xanax or something. Um, good rate, good volume, gas is better, fever's gone, labs are normal, off all pressors. Did they pass the leak test? What the heck is that, Ms. Garrison? Well, when this cup is inflated, you will hear no sound. So prior to extubation, <laughs> The pulmonologist will deflate the cuff. We want to hear sound. We don't hear sound. This is the hardest thing to tell a patient. Listen, I think you've got some airway swelling. We're going to abort. We're not going to pull the tube today. We're going to try again tomorrow. I'm going to put you on steroids for 24 hours, and we'll try again tomorrow. Talk about a disappointed family. Talk about a disappointed nurse. At that you know, that's tough. That's tough. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. I want you to pass the leak test. I don't want your cuff to leak while you're still intubated, but I, when it's time to extubate, when they deflate that cuff, I want to hear the sound, because that tube down your throat for many, many days causes airway swelling. Steroids are a beautiful thing, but come on. Steroids raise your blood sugar, and they mask infection. I'm just saying. Now look, miss post-nasal drip, Gets pharyngitis once a year, honey, give me the steroid shot. Give it to me. Mm -hmm. Give it to me right here. I love, and then I go home later that and clean the house. Like the energizer's <laughs> All right. How are we going to excavate this patient? First, we explain the procedure. Do I have that right there? No, but write down. The first thing I do is I explain the procedure. 
We're going to extubate you. That's why I'm going to sit you straight up. Here comes the towel. Have the suction ready to go. And not, of course, the ballot is connected to the men's circuitry and respiratory will suction them out real good before we pull the tube. But then, now listen, we haven't extubated anybody yet in clinical, but the clinical instructor reserves the right to stand behind the student because phlegm will fly. I use you as a human shield, mm -hmm. phlegm will fly. And then we better have that yanker ready to rock and roll. Honey, they're gonna have secretions in there. Every nurse has a, a weakness, and mine is spew. Mm -hmm. It's spew. <coughs> So I'll be high behind you. All right. And you, my students checking residual and clinical, never accidentally squirt your clinical instructor with the residual from the OG2. That's not good. All right. So have that oxygen source ready to rock and roll. And crazy as it sounds, it's probably going to be a nasal cannula. No kidding. Now's the time not to take lunch. Keep assessing your patient. It requires incredible nursing care to support this patient during this weaning process. You gotta be a coach, you have to be an encourager, you need to put some heat gloves on and hold that hand. It's not, it's not fun. You ever been a patient? Who's been a patient? Raise your hand. It ain't, it's kind of scary. Mm -hmm. it, whether it's an appendectomy or a gallbladder or a bilateral when you were on hernia, or something else, it's none of it's fun. All right, that protocol, you know, you know what to do, increase the head bed to 30 degrees. Lovenox, at least DVTs, well, they've got a bleeding problem, so we can't have the Lovenox, well then put the SCDs on. Protonics, well, what if they're on Tagamet or something else, Zantac, well, that'll work too. Respiratory does the mouth care at EJ, Q4 with the chlorhexidine. And um, is today the day we're gonna turn off the sedation and pull that too? I love that. This video I think is a hoot. I think this is just a little hoot. Now, believe it or not, I've seen some patients extremely work way to the early event that didn't need sedation. That's not gonna be me, I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you it's not gonna be me. Um, so let's look, let's look at this video. I think it's gonna work. I hope it works. Please work. Control. It says control. Just to make your mark here at Kaiser Permanente, please sanitize or wash your hands at every stop. Our patients are counting on you to keep it clean. Every patient, every time. Good morning. Who do we have here? This is Laura Ketterman, 35. She was admitted to the medical surgical unit a week ago with the flu. She did not receive the flu vaccine. Three days ago, she was transferred here and intubated. Yesterday, she became febrile, and chest x-ray indicates right lower lobe pneumonia. The culture is pending, and PCR indicates it's probably Staph aureus. We're concerned that it's MRSA. So our patient developed this infection in our ICU after she was admitted and intubated? Definitely, this developed post-intubation, which makes it absolutely a hospital-acquired pneumonia. Does anybody have any idea how this happened? What about poor hand hygiene? Staph aureus. The woman was looking at the thing. I grew up squirt when she came in my room. Yeah. I agree. Hand hygiene is the best place to start. Or it could have been an omission of any of the things that we do every day in the ICU to prevent ventilator-associated pneumonia. We could have missed oral care with chlorhexidine. We could have missed elevating the head of the bed from 30 to 45 degrees. We could have missed the daily sedation vacation or an assessment of the readiness to extubate. So what do we need to do to make sure that we do these things with every ventilated patient in the ICU every day? Wash or deep during your hands for every patient, every time. It's a good little video because I got something to tell you. 
Now, I hope I can go back tomorrow and hand out. So what should I do? Go to just close it. Just close it right here. Mm -hmm. okay. Guess what? This patient acquired a hospital-acquired infection after they were admitted, the hospital's not going to be admitted, excuse me, reimbursed mm -hmm. to care for that Fendi patient. They're going to do it, and that's why hospitals are in the red and not in the black. <coughs> You gotta dot your I's and cross your T's. You gotta wash your hands. Hey, I told my students in orientation, I'm not worried when there's yellow on the door and contact or isolation. I'm worried when I took care of them a week, Tuesday and Wednesday, and then I come back the next week and there's yellow on the door. And did we see that this week? Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. Now, it wasn't a vent thing, but it was MRSA in the womb. Um, all right. <clears throat> that patient was very awake and alert, and I have seen awake and alert patients. Oh, so what's the ideal way to communicate with her? Is it charades and mild me what you want? Oh, heck no. That's why nurses drink. That's why you will be so frustrated, kind of kidding, but not really. And um, a communication board will be helpful. Simple yes, no answers are okay. Suctioning the intubated patient. Specific steps explain. Hyperoxygenate. Advance the tube. Slowly on the way out. Assess the oxygenation and document what you saw. Scant, moderate, copious amount of what color? Wrist restraint. Does every intubated patient need wrist restraints? Not necessarily. But the moment they go for that tube, you just bought yourself some restraints. But when they have restraints, you document well the distal circulation. Chart with the jury in mind. Chart with the jury in mind. What about nutrition? Should vented patients be fed? Heck yeah. We've talked about it. Do you agree that the diaphragm is a muscle that needs to be fed? Mm -hmm. What kind of tube feeding will the doc order? Well, what system's on fire? Kidneys? <coughs> Diabetes? <coughs> Nursing priorities for administering tube feedings. We've talked about checking the residuals. Hey, evidence-based practice, Ms. Garrison says you don't even need to check the residuals. Well, when you worry, you're still gonna check it. And I'm usually not a little rebel. What kind of teaching? Keep it simple, guys. Don't pull your tube. And when that family comes in the room, ow, that's gonna be a bruise. Um, when that family comes in the room, hey, the reason you can't use the soft brush restraints, your dad is going to pull too. 1976, Nancy Moulter did the study, a nurse. What are the needs of the family members of the critically ill adult? They need hope and information. So that's what I try to give them. We're not supposed to say, hey, I'll sue your shoes, but I'll sue your shoes. So I am all about the family. How are we feeling about this? Was this helpful? Yes. Good. Even if you've been in clinical with the vet, do you understand it more now? Yes. Good. Good evening. Okay, everybody sign this.